Um, so I just want to say good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our fifth live question and answer. Um, so for those of you who do not know me, I am Gemma Hillier Moses, the founder of Move Charity and the co-founder of 5K Your Way. And I'm your co-host today with the superwoman planking lady and <laughs> co-founder of 5K Your Way, Lucy Gossard. So I don't need to call you a superwoman Hi. triathlete anymore. I just go planking lady. <laughs> yeah, one day, one day you'll get my name right though, Gem. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> One day. We always have Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, so Lucy, it's great to have you back. We can see you're at work. So thank you for joining us again. And we have a very special, what I'm going to call our Sheffield crew with whoop, us this whoop. morning. So, <laughs> well, this morning, this afternoon, um, with our panel of experts from Sheffield. So really, really great to have you guys on. And um, before we get started, I'm just going to give everybody a brief introduction and then you guys can really talk about what you do, um, what you've been up to and the questions that we're going to we're going to ask you. So first up, those of you who've been on our question and answers before, our very first one, actually, we had Rebecca Robinson. So give us a wave, Rebecca. <laughs> so Rebecca is a consultant in sports and exercise medicine, but is also our 5K Away Sheffield ambassador. So she was one of the first, um, experts on our panel on our first ever live question and answer and has been doing some incredible work, especially around COVID-19 and exercise. So really excited to listen to what Rebecca has to say today. Um, we also have Helen Quirk here. So give us a wave, Helen. Someone knows who you are. <laughs> so um, Helen is our Wonder Woman fancy dress lady. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find out a little bit more about that later. But she's a woman of many talents. <laughs> um, so she's a researcher in exercise psychology at Sheffield Hallam University and also our um, a fellow 5K away Sheffield ambassador with Rebecca as well. And finally, but last but not certainly least, we have Debbie, and I'm definitely going to say your surname wrong, Debbie, Rowley? Or Rowley? Yeah, no, right? perfect. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just Lucy's that I get wrong. Um, so, what, <laughs> so it's really, really great to have Debbie um, on our question and answer because Debbie is an advanced physiotherapist working at Sheffield Children's um, NHS Foundation Trust. And I've done some work with Debbie. We work um, together from referrals on some of our MOVE online programmes. Um, and also the Sheffield Do It For You Day. So it's, I'm really excited to have you on, Debbie, because I think it brings in a different conversation around children and young people that we haven't actually had on here before. So um, really, really exciting. So I guess, um, and this is probably the reason why these go on a little bit longer, because I love an introduction. <laughs> but first of all, I've, I have got a really exciting announcement. And um, so over the last two months, I know some of you have been involved in the 2.6 London Marathon Challenge um, that was set when London Marathon was cancelled. Helen has been um, massively involved and so have um, all of our other supporters in our community. And we worked out yesterday that our supporters and community have raised an incredible £13,809.89. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, for Move Charity as a whole and also um, for our 5K Away programmes. And we, I literally couldn't believe it when I read that and I added up the total. And it just shows what an incredible community of supporters that we do have um, that really believe in the work as much as we do, that we deliver. Um, so I guess um, from the whole of us as a team, um, from the bottom of our heart, thank you so much um, for helping to do that um, and raise that incredible amount of money. So thank you. And Georgie's going to release a video in the next couple of days, um, which shows all the amazing challenges and activations that's been going on. So, so yes, well done, guys. <laughs> awesome work. Jen, can I can I just add a, a personal thank you? And um, for me, it's I find it really humbling. There are so many charities out there, um, and of all the charities that people have decided to donate to us. Um, and when people that we don't know, um, that we don't even know know about us as a charity and as an organisation um, decide to give us their money, particularly at the moment, it really it really does mean so much. So, yeah, just, just thanking you personally yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. And I think what we wanted to do, Helen, we know that your expertise isn't in just in fancy dress and fundraising. <laughs> but we thought it'd be amazing, like what better way to kick off the question and answer and actually talk about you and your challenge and why you did it. Because I think yeah. 
like it brought a smart it kicked off the 2.6 challenge for move charity really like it really did and I remember just watching all your videos being in awe of your fancy dress cupboard for one <laughs> but also being really inspired to to fundraise my like to pick a challenge myself and and I'm sure you inspired so many others so I just want to ask you to tell kind of our community what did you do but also why you did it and how much you raised as well by doing it yeah sure so um the 2.6 challenge was like you say it was about people thinking up a challenge that involved two or six or 2.6 or 26 and just any combination of that number um so I was thinking what could I do I wanted to do 2.6 hours of something and I wanted to do something that wasn't really something that I would usually do um so I'm quite a keen runner so I wasn't kind of going to go out running for 2.6 hours um so my original thought was to do 2.6 hours of skipping <laughs> and after oh. two minutes of skipping <laughs> I am so glad I did not choose that it's hard it's, isn't it yeah. I did 2.6 minutes yeah yeah so and then I kind of like floated the idea to uh, my husband and he was like are you sure are you sure you want to do 2.6 hours of skipping and I was like well you know it, well, it'll be fine um but no I decided then to do 26 minutes of six different activities which in total came to 2.6 hours um and um I love fancy dress um I always have done um I think it's since going to uni when we used to do fancy dress pretty much every other week and I've kept a lot of it. Um, so I, all that stuff, sadly, was stuff I just had <laughs> already. It, it um, was the most amazing fancy dress <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so yeah, for anyone that didn't know what I did, I did two, uh, 26 minutes um, of running dressed as Banana Man. And I tried to, because everything I did was within the guidance uh, of, of one outdoor you know, activity a day. So I got up and out quite early one to try and you know do it when there was no one going to see me but also just you know trying to get away from the you know the crowds and things so I did that and then I got back and did 26 minutes of skipping dressed as a robber oh. which was fun you know I had the music on and my neighbor was kind of looking over and they were basically laughing at me um then I did 26 minutes of zumba um which I am not good at <laughs> but I did that in a, an inflatable ghost Buster costume, um, which was so I literally laughed the whole the whole way through. It was so funny. Then I did a twenty six minute row dressed as Pocahontas, twenty six minute hit um, in kind of like eighties rave um, gear, and my husband joined me for that dressed as a clown, which was great. <laughs> and then I finished <laughs> off with twenty six minutes of body combat, which I've never really done before, but I just found a video online and did that dressed as Batman. Um, and then I was ready for a sit down, but it was just really great. Um, and I was just completely blown away by how generous all my friends and family were. Um, and I think partly because I was keeping people entertained throughout the day as well. Um, and I was getting messages from people I haven't heard from in years, you know, saying, can't believe you've still got all that fancy dress. And, and, yeah, it was, it was really great. We just, we just had such a great time. Um, yeah, it was and and I think what it shows as well is often with fundraising like people think that you have to do say an event or a massive massive challenge and what you did was extremely challenging but it was from your own home and it shows the creativity in fundraising but to entertain yourself but also entertain other people so it's not just about you know it is about raising money for causes that you feel passionate about but it's also about you know you will now remember forever what you did in lockdown on that Saturday yeah yeah <laughs> which is really really great that you know we, we we can use social media for really good use can't we and mm -hmm. um I'm not we're not huge on Instagram and we didn't really know how to do Instagram live but you know we, we bumbled our way through and um Tom was pretty um proud to be my content manager for the day and he was <laughs> really getting into it um so yeah, it just meant that we could like get it out there. And I think that really helped um, just, you know, to, to spread the word and, and get, keep people entertained really. Yeah. So can I, can I give to uh, a couple of shout outs? Yeah. Um, yeah. To just whilst we're on the, we're going completely off topic. There's no way we'll be 40 minutes. But, um, 
Peter Hollins, who I'm not sure how much he climbed, something like 260 laps up a 50 meter hill in his garden. Wasn't, wasn't it like 2,600 meters 600 of elevation? Meters, yeah, yeah, running up this 30 meter hill. Um, so he's part of Team Erdinger. Boo Albert, who also raised huge amounts of money doing some crazy challenge in a garden. So she's part of Team Erdinger. Um, and the amazing Nikki Bartlett, who's a professional triathlete, who oh, also raised huge amounts of money climbing Everest on uh, her indoor bike trainer at the weekend. So, um, yeah, loads of loads of amazing people. Um, and, yeah, I think it's really it's, re- it's really cool that the Erdinger team has been supporting it as well. So just a little shout out to, to Team Erdinger. Yeah, no, absolutely amazing. And I think um, actually just watching, you know, I was really inspired by Helen's, um, at, like what she did with her, um, all of the fancy dress. And then when I saw the Everest climb, I was like, I'll just sit with my cup of tea and watch you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was inspired with no intention of even trying to do that. It was absolutely insane. But yeah, all of you, like, because I know Lucy and Tom did the Everest climb and they, you were on your bike for 11 hours. Was it 11 hours? Tom, Tom was on for 11. I was on for 10. <laughs> <laughs> Not competitive at Sorry, all, then. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> You've thrown him under the bus there. Brilliant. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, again, like, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much to everybody who's fundraising. And I guess on the topic of moving, kind of moving in creative ways, what I wanted to do is, first of all, talk to Rebecca. Um, so, You've been doing, we've seen quite a lot of what you've been doing recently on talks and virtual workshops around um, exercise and COVID-19. And I know there's been a variety of the work that you've been doing, but it'd be really great to hear. I guess I've got a couple of areas, but I wanted to start with um, talking about actually, so there's an element of actually how we ourselves can protect ourselves from illness at this current time. But then I think we haven't really spoke about this. Actually, if people have had COVID-19, like how do you recover and then get back to being active again? Because I think that's a topic that, you know, not I don't see very often on social media. So it'd be great to go into those if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. And um, at any point, people just kind of jump in and um, suggest. Um, anything I haven't covered but I think like before this whole situation actually Gemma you started it off because I've never really done anything on social media like live and it's not something that I really thought about I don't know if Lucy sort of feels the same sometimes medically you kind of like it's 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 a different form because you're so used to having like the one-to-ones with your patient Mm. um I think most of my work in terms of sports sport got closed down in March and it was quite a big job to close down elite sports and you might think life will become quite quiet then but of course the athletes all in their own homes and all observing the rules have been adapting to training um, and we've kept that going and these are the people that are hoping now to go to the Olympics next year so it really hasn't quietened down um, at all they're all in a very similar situation as all of us that can't go out and do 5k away or, or park run um, so I guess like in a couple of ways there are a lot of parallels because we want to keep that group active because for many of them that is their job like Lucy you'll know exactly what that that means Mm. um but what we did start doing really early on was thinking well what about this virus what do we know very little what data is there you know we're driven by data by getting the textbooks out or being online and actually in terms of this virus well it seemed to be that when people got it even like the mild version which is when they don't need to go to hospital they might feel pretty poorly but they're okay and you might think it'd be like a flu where okay like um all of us go back out and train it just didn't seem and doesn't seem to behave like that for a lot of people and I guess that got me a little concerned to do all this work for elite athletes and we've got them every day and not just me as a doctor but once they're past a point they can do a little bit we've got the coach right there but we've also got their psychology strength and conditioning physiotherapy everything around them and I guess I was just thinking well if this isn't a very nice virus not one way you're going to bounce back I know as a runner what runners are like and that the minute people that love their sport can go back out and do it, we do. And it's not always the right thing to do. So I guess at that point, it was just a case of, well, could I do a little clinic? And because the clinic that I work for in London, very rarely because I'm based in Sheffield and actually up until lockdown and everybody realising what we can do remotely, up until then, it, you know, it's not been that feasible to go. But they said, yes, you can do run a clinic let's run it for free because this is a nice virus we don't really want people to have to pay because they've had to have it but just giving like a short bit of advice to try and guide people back 
Um, I guess with that, the evidence that I've used, again, it's so, so thin on the ground, but luckily in sport, we've got like the best respiratory docs. We take advice from like the specialist in virology. We take advice from cardiology, all the things that we would worry about and get the best that we know. So that really, it's kind of, it's been nice to be able to share that with the general active population. Yeah, brilliant. And can you share some of those, um, that research in terms of, so if, for example, we like somebody in our community has, even if they, you know, if they're living with or beyond cancer and, and has had COVID-19 and has recovered and wants to get back in touch with you, what should they be looking for? Or what should they be aware of? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, first of all, obviously, like not all of our community is classed in that vulnerable group. Yeah. And actually, some of the people that are in that vulnerable group will have COVID and have it quite mildly. Um, again, being able to this clinic, it's been nice to have some patients who've had recent or previous cancer. And actually, it's for some of them, it's really not impacted their recovery differently. Obviously, for those that have been sort of shielded or had to be extremely vulnerable and staying indoors, that might be different in terms of what they can actually access to do. But basically, for somebody who has a fairly uncomplicated course with their illness, we're definitely saying for sport, like if from the time that they get ill, it's a minimum of 10 days. And this was one of the respiratory doctors, um, James Hull, who said this initially, and he was mostly concerned right then about the lung injury that was being seen. And actually, we know now, not just from people who've been in the community and maybe in these days taking their bike out and come off their bike without being ill at all, but they might have had a chest x-ray and the changes of the coronavirus have been there. The same has actually been reported, Lucy will probably have known, there's two people going for routine x-rays um, in oncology. So we know mm. that have it, stay without symptoms, but there is still that impact on the lungs. So we've basically said anybody gets any symptoms, even miles, let's totally rest. So for some that'll be 10 days, but for some it will be longer because some of the people will experience these little spikes or big spikes in the illness kind of trying to, as if it's trying to come back. So and 10 days minimum or until the symptoms have gone, it's really shutting people down from their normal sports. And after that, it's a very gentle seven days of getting back into the rhythm of exercise. But if you were running, we <coughs> Let's, let's just walk um, and getting people to report how tired they feel because often they feel really, really tired. Um, and also either using heart rate, ideally if people have got heart rate monitor, but often their rate of perceived exertion correlates really well. And what's been interesting is that since that became kind of the idea that we had, the specialists in cardiology have said, well, there's some inflammation going on here. And we know that some people will get inflammation around the heart, like that's myocarditis they will have gone to hospital likely for that reason and they'll be quite poorly but for other people who don't experience that we do think that there is still inflammation around the heart and that's another good reason not to get straight back into sport take things really really steadily so yeah. informed by those issues yeah and that's really interesting because I was going to ask you so moving back to when you look at those seven days before you actually start doing any of activity again is that cardio activity or can people think about because obviously a strength like losing muscle mass um with with rest is is going to happen and especially for our population that you know they might you know sitting around isn't really going to help them but can some sort of functional movements really help would that is that something that you could do in that period or sometimes the case quite often people have had quite a lot of fatigue, but also in some cases they might have been sitting on the sofa for most of the week because they feel really yeah. so actually I think if you look they feel good and they would normally do a couple of strength sessions it might well be a case of let's just work into a bit of range of movement again even if they've had mild impact on their breathing something that helps diaphragmatic breathing would probably be a really good first step I'd caution people away from heavier strength and conditioning partly because they might have lost that range but also again it's still a physiological strain um yeah. sort of work i mean i've had quite a few people even saying they're going to do their jobs the sort of mental side has sort of brought them back and regressed their recovery a bit so it's kind of like backing up on all fronts really but yeah and it's really really great to hear from your expert opinion and also what experience you've had with people developing and like i think we we always mm -hmm. say this you know it is everybody is individual aren't they like that is important to be aware of as well 
Do you think there's anything specific, any specific advice that you you would want to share with people who are currently on on cancer treatment who might have contracted COVID um, or perhaps have recently finished their their cancer treatment? I mean, yeah, I imagine it's the same guidance, um, and it probably wouldn't change. And and the emphasis is is really you've got to be patient, and if anything, be over cautious. But having any, any I think if anything, Lucy, this would have to be a joint approach and run it by you on this. <laughs> in terms of talking to their specialists and just checking early on. In I know that, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously people are being tested really closely in terms of developing any of the early symptoms or any signs of a temperature. Um, there are some other considerations. We know there is seem to be a high risk of issues like blood clots as a complication obviously a cancer population is at higher risk so i guess we don't want people pushing through doing exercise but you know maybe just encouraging if you can if you feel just up to it just pottering a little bit around your house as opposed to being totally immobile and obviously reporting any symptoms in sooner if you if people feel like they're recovering but actually they're still quite short of breath and it's four five six weeks later that's probably the time do you know, that's the time in sport that at the moment we're being cautious and doing some extra tests. I think mm. that's certainly people's oncologists or they themselves will be keeping a closer rein, but that might be the point at which saying, well, actually, even if they've recently finished treatment and are basically okay, that might be the point just to look a little bit further and check that there aren't any complications. Yeah, and I think and I guess okay. it's in oh sorry, no, I guess okay. it's important to note that the tests at the moment are are not. 100% accurate by any means so mm. a negative test does not mean that you you haven't had it mm. um and so so as as you suggested Rebecca um in the hospital if someone has a negative test but they have chest x-ray changes and they have symptoms we assume that they they do have the have the COVID infection um and so yeah I I, I guess if you've had a viral illness and you've been tested and it's negative but symptoms are persisting it's it's perhaps safer to to assume that you might have had it rather than say no it wasn't COVID it was just something else. I think and I think you all have experienced this too Lucy there's kind of a um, spectrum and we're getting more and more different symptoms but again in elite sport we've not really tested because we've thought well actually these people in terms of elite sport they get the medical um, support all of the time but we don't want to detract from NHS testing so actually we just look at that risk and say does that actually you know, does that impact them as an elite athlete? We don't want them mm. getting less attention in terms of not accessing the NHS. But in general, I would say that I haven't really needed to test because you get three or four symptoms that just seem like too much. You know, what's the coincidence? Again, a lot of people have been self-isolated. Well, most everybody's been on lockdown. But so there aren't as many respiratory illnesses. And yes, there's still some hay fever, there's still some colds. But actually, those symptoms coming together, I think sometimes clinically I'd be more confident than the test. Yeah and it's really interesting because of the healthcare professionals that I know who've been tested when they describe their symptoms you would have said well that's definitely COVID and, and the, yet the test comes back negative um, and I guess we just don't know that yeah we don't know how accurate these these tests are and um, yeah we the testing is getting more and more prevalent isn't it so we'll, we'll certainly in a few weeks time we'll know a lot more. And I think just to say on those points as well, if people, so if people are getting worried that, you know, they've been through the illness and the, and the virus and that they're in the recovery, but they're still struggling with things, I think people are uh, not making use of going to a GP or talking to their GP or going to their, you know, back to their oncologist if they're going through their treatment or their support team. And I think it's, we spoke to Debbie and we'll come on to this as well, but how these services are still available for you mm. to access. And I think people feel that, those services have just gone away because of COVID-19 and they really haven't, have they? Absolutely not. And I, I think, you know, the hospital that I'm working in and all my GP friends, all my doctor friends are are really trying to, to get the word out that we would much rather people phoned us and came to see us. And, and GPs, you know, GPs are sitting there twiddling their thumbs, waiting for people to contact them because people don't want to bother them. And then, yeah, the NHS is certainly up and running and, we'd always much rather have a phone call um, and, and have the opportunity to talk things through with you than, um, than not. Real, yeah. So just a last one for Rebecca before we move on to Debbie, um, to have a chat with you, Debbie. So Rebecca, we spoke about this. So in light of the 
sort of confusing <laughs> government <laughs> announcement. <laughs> I'm not going to put too much of my opinion on that. Um, government strategy about act like activities. What we kind of wanted to ask you: What are the best activities to engage in or avoid for somebody who perhaps um, you know people living with and beyond cancer? Where? Do, what? Do, what is your opinion on, on that? I think it's we've got this funny blend of things that people can do. So people that can and usually do say run or cycle or walk, it's been relatively straightforward or long observing social distancing, although for some difficult if they can't meet up with their usual groups. So I think that has benefits in terms of people not turning to new sports that they maybe will find difficult to get into in terms of just injury risk or access. But I think those individual sports are straightforward. There are, there are certainly some that are coming back online in terms of people being able to access um, right now, such as um, golf, such as tennis, like with a family member. But I think we've, we've got a group here who have adapted um, to life with or beyond cancer in terms of that often changes what someone's sporting, like not ambitions overall, but their experience has been. So, while sadly it's not opened um, the doors to events like Park from a 5k away, I kind of don't have any concerns that this group won't be as innovative. So I think at the moment, while we're still on lockdown, it's just exploiting the things that we've all learned so far. And if that's like getting some group sessions, like the brilliant one that you did Gemma with um, Tom, I think it was a few weeks ago, um, getting people to do those activities. If people are still shielding, because people still will be, or mostly in the houses, Again, gyms aren't open, but I bet everyone's a lot better at, I am finally a bit better at home-based strength and conditioning and gym work um, than I was. Um, so I think it's it's looking at the positives that we've got so far and, and building on those. You know, yeah, and I think it's, I, I think for anyone who's on treatment or just finished treatment, I would absolutely recommend talking to your oncologist or your nurse specialist about what their advice is because I, I think the government letter is very stark and certain patients will be much lower risk than other patients um, and it may well be that your oncologist says to you you know yeah you can go out for a walk just stay away from people you could so, so I, I think ask yeah. that there is no one size fits all but talk to whoever is looking after you and ask ask what their opinion is as to how mm -hmm. how strictly you need to shield because I am absolutely certain there are some people locking themselves away completely who don't need to do that yeah brilliant yeah that's really good advice so i think um so, so i think we're to save us going into two hours of conversation <laughs> which is always the risk but so we're going to move into have a chat with debbie now and obviously remember you can all chip in on this so thank you for that rebecca but Debbie, we kind of we haven't really touched on um, children living with the beyond cancer too much recently. And we wanted to talk about, I guess I wanted to ask you, what does life look like for you as a physiotherapist and working in the NHS right now? Um, well, it's quite different. <laughs> We're not seeing as many face to face patients as we normally would be, um, which um, has proved challenging at times, but it's opened a lot of doors for people, I think, as well. And um, so we are still, as you said, open for business. We're seeing everybody and um, whether that be virtually or ringing or the people that we do need to see, we are seeing in clinic or as outpatients or on the ward. So, um, yeah, firstly, completely agree. If you've got questions or you need to ask anything, just give us a call because we are still there at work <laughs> doing our jobs. Um, but yeah, it's it's different and definitely engaging children in virtual clinics is quite tricky yeah. I think um, especially the younger younger kids that's quite a tricky thing to do um, but I think we're just using different forums for things we've definitely worked out a lot of there's a lot of online um, classes and brilliant brilliant stuff online that we've been engaging our kids with there's some really nice yoga um if there's any kids or families that want to do yoga together cosmic kids is brilliant online ah. <laughs> don't know if anybody's we'll put, tried we it we can link to this can't yeah. we then? yeah yeah we'll link to that um, so cosmic kids cosmic kids yeah and the there's a brilliant lady that runs that and she does stories for children and does yoga moves alongside the story. So it's really great, definitely for primary school kids. So we've been doing um, that kind of stuff um, 
and yeah doing a lot more kind of virtual virtual consultations i think i think what we're finding is that families initially were very very good at getting their kids out in the garden especially in the nice warm weather and doing loads of really lovely stuff and i think everybody is fit is feeling a little bit tireder of it now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So it's trying to motivate everybody to keep going, really, and and trying to um, get kids to play with it because it's really hard. You know, I'm a, a mum of two young kids and trying to work, manage kids at home, um, the change in circumstance. It's it's tricky, you know, and it is tricky to keep up the motivation and the and the inspiration for play. And I think I think that's one thing that we're definitely trying to do as a team at the Children's Hospital is trying to give those ideas to people. Yeah. And Debbie, can I ask you, it's kind of a personal question, but there'll be a lot of people that are watching that, uh, you know, are currently working and have kids. And like, you know, I, you know, we've I've been in lockdown with no kids and I've been able to get off with, on with things. But how so like how do you make sure that you look after yourself and you exercise do you do it with the kids and because you're you know as a parent your health and well-being is extremely important and if everybody else comes first other than you it starts to take its toll doesn't it yeah and I, I think it's been hard actually with um being only able to go out once a day it was quite tricky I I definitely felt guilty if I went out for a run and left the kids at home because that meant that then they didn't really get to go out and do that so um what I mean what we've done I mean I'm lucky that there's two of us at home and we can swap that about a little bit um and um I guess I guess it's just trying to be a bit more inventive so um I could take my little one out on his bike and I'd run alongside him that kind of thing just try and keep us all going but to be honest I've been a lot more active around the house (laughs) 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 I've been doing a lot of running around the garden uh, we set up our own little um, running track the other day with, with the paddling pool in the middle. So we called it the steeple trace chase. And, uh, oh, that's amazing. We, yeah, we ran through the paddling pool and ran around our garden about 260 times. So, yeah, I think there are inventive ways of keeping you, you active as a family. I, th- I think the hard thing is, is the motivation of it all. And I, f- I find that quite hard myself let alone for you know people that are coping with lots of other things on top of that so I think you know what what I do want to put across is that you know there are a lot of services out there are happy to help with that and happy to give you ideas of things that you can be doing at home so you know please get in touch with us because we're we're building up a massive amount of different things that you know it takes time to look for doesn't it you know it takes time to think about and if we can give you some links to things that might help out and you know we're there to help so Debbie can I ask sorry can I ask um with your impatience on Mm. chemo because in in adult services it's yeah it's heartbreaking seeing patients stuck in hospital on their own without visitors and um you know I look I look after quite a lot of teenage young adult patients and um obviously with social distancing all the normal group activities and and kind of socializing opportunities are taken away how are you managing that with the the children in the oncology wards um so at our hospital um children are allowed one visitor so that that being a parent generally or a carer um and the rest of the time to be honest they're doing they're doing a lot of kind of zoom and that kind of thing um, it's really tricky from a play point of view. So our play specialists are still working and they are trying mm. to engage children in that. But from a peer support point of view, it's really hard. And I think um, we're encouraging families to kind of do a lot of social um, stuff via Zoom and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's tricky. It's probably very similar to adults apart from they have a a parent with them so that is nice Mm. but from a peer support in terms of children on to playing with other children it's yeah it's not happening at the minute and I think that's one one thing that a lot of people are quite worried about is that that children will lose that ability to play with each other a little bit Mm. and so yeah it's trying to trying to work out ways of of how we can engage children in groups but but you know primary school kids 
especially my experiences with my little one are that he'd go on Zoom for a couple of minutes and then he's not interested at all yeah. and runs off and does his own thing. So it is, it is hard, actually, yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to add, um, not just on to, just going back slightly. Um, so you spoke about, um, there's obviously a lot of activities that people could engage with, like either if they got in contact with you or um, they looked on social media and like the Cosmo Yoga. But mm. like you said, and I think this is a question for both you and Helen, is around that motivation. So like, there's, it's great that there's so much, but sometimes it can be overwhelming. But if I was a parent yeah. and I had, you know, not just if I'm a parent, but if I had, for example, if I was a parent who had a young child going through um, their treatment, but I wanted to put some structure um, into their life, how do I go about doing that? Like, what are the tools and what tips can you give me to be able mm. to put that structure in? So we're, we're still advising a lot of people to, to do timetables at home. And I know that schools are generally sending out quite a lot of timetabled activities as well so um we're encouraging families to do like a daily timetable where they have activities set through the day including exercise as part of that um, and that can include you know even the standard stuff of getting up and getting a getting dressed in the morning making sure they're having their three meals a day you know that really that kind of stuff that when time seems to just go on and on, you forget sometimes that you need all these things as well. Um, so yeah, we've included those, encourage people to include like lunch break and playtime and that kind of thing in into their, their normal timetables. Um, just to try and keep kids, kids like stress. <laughs> so yeah. having that kind of thing is, has proved quite useful actually. Real, yeah. And Helen, did you have anything to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I think, I think like Debbie's just said, obviously having routine is so important. And I think it was probably quite easy to slip into kind of school holiday mode at the beginning and just think, oh, let's just see hmm. where the days take us. But I guess that quite quickly loses its novelty, especially when you're kind of trying to peel children off the, the roof and, and the ceiling kind of thing. So definitely hmm. having routine. And I think something that's just made me think then when you're when you do have a family and you do have this restriction on the amount of time you can spend outside or the number of times you can go there's going to be competing demands there isn't there so you know mum mm -hmm. might want to go for a run dad might also want to go out for a walk or a bike ride the kids want to do something else and so maybe you know it's about just all sitting down and trying to have that discussion around what does everyone want to get out mm -hmm. of today yeah. how can we get that work how can we make that work yes, we might not all be able to do what we want to do today, but maybe we could do what you want to do tomorrow and the next day and just have that conversation because I think sometimes it's easy to assume that, you know, your fellow, your family members know what you know what you want, but sometimes you just have to have quite open conversations and say, look, what do we all want to get out of today? And let's try and make that happen. Yeah, that's a really, really good tip. I think anybody can take that, even like, yeah if you're whoever you're sharing the house with that is really good because I think it gives some clarity doesn't it around what you want to do and make sure each of your needs is being met at some point during that week yeah mm -hmm. really good advice so let's just move on um so we wanted to give you guys the opportunity to talk about the research project that you guys um are starting or have launched um so I'll let you guys I'll let you go into it really if you could give the audience a little chance to hear about that um, okay, so um, I was lucky enough to get some NIHR funding um, to do an internship uh, this time last year. Um, and myself and Helen, as my supervisor, have come up with a project to look at how active children are in hospital. So when they're diagnosed with um, cancer and um, how active they are in and at home as well so what during treatment how much are they moving basically and um we were really lucky that we've got some funding from the children's hospital charity to continue with that so when the world is up and running again <laughs> we have some money <laughs> um to <laughs> to have a look at how active our kids are um with the aim that when we know how they are we can maybe look at why and when and how to 
um, kind of target physical activity with that population. Oh, I wasn't sure if Helen was going to say, I thought I saw your lips moving, so I was like, I'm not going to interrupt. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, and so I think, yeah, once the, you know, we're allowed to kind of do research again, we're really looking forward to, you know, it's, it's something really positive, isn't it, to look forward to. Um, mm. And it's kind of, it's not COVID related, but, you know, physical activity post COVID and post lockdown is going to be so important. So in a way, it will have a lot of relevance. Um, but it's just really nice to have that to kind of look forward to when we go back to whatever the, the new normal is. Um, yeah. yeah let's... No, it's just it's such a big dilemma, isn't it? Because um, I, it's something I really struggle with as an oncologist. Obviously, I treat adult patients, but at what point in their cancer trajectory do I bring up the importance of being active um, mm. and I've, I've gone in you know drums blazing and, and, and gone in far too hard and you know put people off completely and sometimes uh, you know and, and equally a lot of oncologists don't mention it at all and, and, and finding a time where, where patients are receptive um, and have got the headspace to kind of even contemplate mm -hmm. it is, is really challenging and I guess for children their families it's probably even more challenging yeah and I, I guess it's um a little bit that we don't actually know how how active these kids mm. are so some some there's some research well a little bit of research from the states kind of saying a bit further down the line after treatment that children aren't as active as their peers and you know the consequences of that but there's, there's nothing really saying how active children are during treatment. And, and there's a number of barriers to physical activity during cancer treatment for anybody. Um, and, and I guess it's just having a look at those barriers and whether there's any way that we can help break those barriers down. Mm -hmm. um, or if there's, if there's a time when actually there's fewer barriers and that's the time that we should be speaking to people about it so it's quite it's really interesting and there's very very little research in in children populations so um yeah we're i'm really excited about getting going with it when we when we can yeah, it sounds yeah. a great project and yeah. I, I guess you know for anyone with cancer at the moment i think that for people those people who've been advised to shield the advice has just been extended to the 30th of june and that's another minimum six weeks for yeah. that people are going to have to continue to find innovative ways of of staying active um and i i guess i just reiterating do ask your oncologists what they think yeah. you, you you know they you shouldn't how you should interpret the shielding advice but um yeah it's really challenging there's you know cancer cancer treatment's a barrier and then suddenly you've got the the, the isolation shielding as a mm. huge barrier it's yeah, and I think on that as well, I was going to ask Helen this question around kind of the psychology of um, the physical activity promotion that's going on at the minute. Because I think, like you say, for people living with and beyond cancer, there's a lot <coughs> of information out there that's not necessarily relevant to them. So I guess I just wanted to ask you, like, what, you know, what are the benefits of having that much information out there for anybody to access right now? But then also what challenges have you maybe found during this period that people actually do need to be aware of? Like, what do they need to watch out of and how is it maybe affecting them mentally? Yeah, I think, like you said, there is heaps of stuff out there, um, probably a little bit too much because people are probably getting completely overwhelmed. Um, there's, there's, there's research projects going on that are looking into well-being and how people are coping during... Uh, lockdown, um, lots and lots of research, which again, I'm a little bit worried that there's maybe too too much research um, in terms of everyone trying to ask the same question, um, but that's probably enough for another day. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think obviously there is this realisation that this is a very um, physical um, illness and the symptoms are very physical, but what we have to um, appreciate that the kind of the psychological impact and probably the long-term psychological impact is something we have to be really aware of. Um, but there is lots, um, you know, that, that people can do to, to look after their well-being at this time. 
Um, and I think there is the risk of people trying to do too much and trying to do everything and getting really kind of carried away with everything they see and read um, online and, and on the news and you know you should be doing this you should be doing that it'd be really good if you learn a new language do more cooking and it's like hang on I just I just need to, to figure out how I'm going to kind of deal with this and what's going to work for me um, so yeah in terms of things that you can do there's so much online around advice um, and I think we've touched on loads of it, haven't we, in terms of connecting with people, um, connecting with yourself to a, to a certain extent, trying to understand what works for you and what's going to, you know, push your kind of buttons and, put, you know, family like um, Debbie's, that kind of um, activity in the garden and that's very intuitive to you, but for others, you know, that might not come naturally to them. Mm. So being creative yeah, it sounds like a really good idea, but some people are going to really struggle to, to have those innovative ideas, which I think is where going to the experts is going to be really valuable because sometimes just having some advice that you can take away and interpret and apply to your own life is, is, the, best, is the best way, really. Um, and for me, as well as kind of, I am always going to advocate that people keep moving for their mental health and mental well-being because it's so important, but move in whatever way works for you. Like if, if, if it is kind of doing Zumba dressed as a ghostbuster, if that works, <laughs> if that works, then, then go for it. I think when people hear, oh, I'm allowed to do, you know, an hour of exercise a day, that just doesn't sound appealing to a lot of people. So find something that does work for you. And that might just be putting some music on and having a dance in the kitchen. If that works for you, that's that's going to really help your well-being and really going to help get you through this um but yeah there's there's so much you can do it's just about learning what works for you I think and not getting carried away with all the advice online that perhaps isn't that relevant and it goes back to it being and there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach and you have to be quite in tune with your own kind of feelings and what works for you yeah and that's really really great advice and I think from everybody we've had on the question and answers everybody has a different way of living this last eight weeks and it's been really you know mm. I've been so I've been so inspired but you also know that that doesn't fit your lifestyle but you can take little bits from it so I think yeah I think really really great advice that people should be listening to you know don't be too hard on yourself because you're not making you know doing absolutely everything every oh <laughs> <laughs> got, I don't know what that was. <laughs> but like, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, and I think it's kind of not being so hard on yourself, isn't it? And just you know, do, just finding what's right for you. Brilliant. So, and so I, I, I think oh, can I, I'm yeah. sorry, just just no. going back to so just just to kind of, and we don't think we've touched on it in any of them. How hard it must be for the partners of people with cancer. Um, and there, there's probably at times there may well be some resentment that they're having to shield. Um, that you know we yeah. talked about opening up about with each other about what you want to do, and and uh, but it must. I imagine for people, yeah, for for partners, it's it, it's really tough as well. And and sometimes I think we focus all our discussions about the person yeah. who has a diagnosis, but it it's always more than that, isn't it? I think actually that would be a really good. Ne not next Q&A because we've got a few lined up mm. but I think that's a really I think we could talk a lot around that and bring somebody on um onto the next question and answer so well done for thinking about the next question and answer I <laughs> but yeah you are right because yeah. you yeah because I know personally from going through treatment myself with my husband like how difficult that was but then he was be able to be with me every day when I was going through treatment for mm. weeks. But that reality isn't the same right now. And that's no, difficult on no. both sides, really difficult. Yeah, we are, anyway, we are, a discussion for another day, but um, something, something to I, I think about that, for sure. that would be good to, yeah, I think it would be good to extend to think about, you know, parents and siblings as well that are, are missing yeah. having their their siblings around as much or that are having to shield and, and not, see you know be out as much maybe I think I think it's a really good discussion to have yeah yeah and definitely. a lot of people are going to when the schools open are going to have to make decisions about whether they send their kids back to school as well so yeah, yeah. another day 
Yeah, well, these, you know, this has been incredible to talk to all of you. And I think we've, so we've got one question that I definitely think we should just answer in the group um, from Tony. So hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. <laughs> um, so Tony has a question for Lucy. And I think this might relate to Debbie and potential Rebecca as well. But um, I guess it's for Lucy. So some oncologists still seem to be a bit negative about exercise for cancer patients, even in normal times. And he's just asked what's behind that. Um, I think it, it stems from the old days when the advice was that people with cancer should rest um, and the evidence is very clear that, that now it's, you know, as you know, it's safer to be active through your treatment than it is to be inactive. Um, I, think that me I think it stems partly from a lack of awareness. Um, I'd be interested to hear it, Rebecca, that, well, all of your thoughts actually, partly from a lack of understanding partly because a lot of healthcare professionals themselves act, physical activity is an, an important part of their lives um and partly because and i alluded to it even for someone like me who is so passionate about it and i you know i know the evidence i know how important it is it's finding an appropriate time to bring that up with patients um so for me i always if I have that conversation with the patient, I always feel like the specialist nurses are rolling their eyes at me and going, Lucy's going to start her exercise talk, you know, the professional <laughs> triathlete. And I think that's, that's my, my, you know, my biggest barrier almost is my background. Um, I think, I, I think for, for people who perhaps aren't sporty, they might want to have that conversation, but finding a time when, when, when the patient has got the headspace to, to take it on board is really challenging. Rebecca, I'd, I'd be really interested in your your thoughts. Sports exercise medicine that we deal with really from the beginning, because yeah, there's the sports side, but my the big part of my job that I'm interested in terms of exercise medicine is trying to get people into activity, especially with the diagnosis of cancer, before, during, and after treatment, really. And it's really taking the patient um, with you, I think, um, as the doctor, like all the healthcare professional, whoever that is. I think, yeah, from some of the work that I've done in Sheffield, it's been finding that actually it is either the lack of time or sometimes lack of confidence amongst health. Mm. But actually, because I've sadly finished working at Western Park and um, the hospital in Sheffield now or for now, but um, <laughs> like looking at that population, I don't know what it has been but gosh they really have this drive to want to do something and actually yeah it's not always even we have had quite a lot of people going to 5k away and that's brilliant but it's like actually enabling movement people do feel better but it's finding what is that is it walking the dog in the park is it in the garden and again it's kind of mm -hmm. you know, not all in the same situation as people that have cancer those of us that haven't but it is in a way you know it's like dealing with the change that isolation has brought to all of us there are some similarities and I guess my only you know when we all looked at what we're looking forward to most um after lockdown I think for me 2020 was hopefully apart from working with Olympians it was looking at the research side and that being the area to say well okay we know but what what do we need to know because for example say in young people if we sort of look at sometimes some of those treatments that might have effects into later life when do those changes happen? We don't quite yet know. We seem to think that exercise is a really, really good thing from the evidence we do know. But, but when should we be upping the ante? Are there points in the treatment trajectory that we should think actually, yeah, keep active now? Or are there real points afterwards? So again, I think if we get some of the research mm. development, we'll be able to push that further um, and work more. I think something that I always say when I'm talking to healthcare professionals about it is that often all we need to do is, is just give people, patients permission. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. I used to, to do a lung cancer clinic and, and going back to, you know, what doctors and nurses used to think that rest was the, the best medicine. Um, that is very much the layperson's understanding and their loved one gets told that they have cancer and all they want to do is wrap them in cotton wool and protect them and, and you know, make their cups of tea and do their cooking and do the hoovering and, and, and take away the cancer diagnosis. If any of us were treated like that for, for eight weeks, 12 weeks, however long, we would, we would lose so much fitness and kind of psychological well-being and actually just enabling people and saying, look, it's fine to go outside. Mm. In fact, it's more than fine. It's probably the best thing you can do is go out for a walk every day. Giving them that permission um, is, it can be mind blowing how that can transform people's, people's um, 
physical and psychological well-being so I think that's the first step and I think every healthcare professional is negligent if they're not doing it I think that's the first message that we need to get out and I guess oh sorry Debbie were you just gonna yeah I was gonna I was gonna say permission is a massive thing in pediatrics as well you know we've found a lot of children a, a long time after their cancer treatment that still aren't doing PE at school and it's mm. just because nobody's ever said to them you can wow. now go and do PE <laughs> or, yeah. um, or you can do PE the whole time you know yeah. it's it's really interesting and I do think um professionals sometimes don't feel it's their role um to talk about and and I think that's a culture that's definitely changing and then um, and it's really important that that people are everybody that's working working as a healthcare professional with people with cancer it is their role no. And I, I think that, you know, the, the bigger charities have got a role as well, because if you Google complementary therapies and believe me, I've done it for every single big charity, cancer charity, physical activity is not listed as a complementary therapy on, on a single website that I could find. Um, yet they have acupuncture, they have Reiki, they have loads of loads of other random stuff with very little evidence, um, which makes people feel better. And the evidence for for physical activity is is it's not high quality but we know it makes people feel better and we know it makes them less tired and if that's the very least that it does then it's uh, uh I, I i would argue it's complementary therapy and and it should be being promoted as such um yeah and i guess just to round round this discussion up because really you know hopefully tony we've answered your question there but i know rebecca you and the moving medicine team have worked on th those resources and i'm always keen to talk like to say about those resources and we'll get georgie to share it because as a from a patient point of view you can go into those resources but also from a health professional point of view that's a really big educational tool isn't it it is. Um, it was great fun. It was also kind of hard work drawing it all together. So the adult versions for um, non-communicable illnesses and cancer in there um, was basically patient facing. It's still very live. It's still um, very up to date. And it links the health professional into evidence such as we do have. As, as Lucy said, it's not always the highest quality. Of course. Well, it's high quality, but small studies. And we need to get the mm. best of what we know. We know enough already to say, let's do this. Um, what's the space for... Um, children <laughs> yeah but it's just on the cusp and actually movie medicine are um, working on some coronavirus work too so um it's it's really out there and um hopefully something to link patients into yeah and i think we'll be you know we'll be um signposting from our social media pages to those resources because i think they're just so valuable and like we say from a healthcare professional point of view it's a real simple place to just go and visit and and um, be able to educate yourself on how you talk to patients about exercise and activity when they're going through their treatment and beyond so I think we're gonna I told you we won't keep it to 45 <laughs> minutes we are gonna have to wrap it up there but I could have honestly talked to you guys for hours that was an absolute brilliant discussion and I hope our community found it really useful some new topics of conversation hopefully you were able to take different bits of advice that you can relate to your own life and hopefully we told you something that you may have not known before um, so thank you so, so much to Helen, Rebecca and Debbie and also Lucy, you're my co-host. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on today because you were all giving up your time for free. We'd love the discussion um, and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, thank guys. You. Bye. Bye.